Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you here this morning. Um, before we begin our study, can we open with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we're very thankful for this morning, for the opportunity once again to study, and we're thankful for the things that you've been showing us this week, and for the work that your Holy Spirit has been doing upon our hearts. We just ask, Lord, for your continued presence in these meetings through thy spirit, and that you can draw close to each one of us. Help us to understand these things, especially in the time that we live. And uh, we pray for our various contacts with people, our ministries that we have. Uh, we just ask that your angels can attend us in all that we do. Be with us now in this study, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to continue this study on the 300. So we just had got through basically the first page. And what we were looking at is we were seeing this 300 as a symbol of a warning message. Warning of a close of probation um, that's coming. And of course, as we're going through judges, because that's why we're studying this 300, the 300 of Gideon, uh, we're trying to understand how that 300 of Gideon, what symbol it has, as applied to this movement, as applied to the July 18, 2020 prediction, and how it applies presently. So where do we exactly place this 300? Now, one of the things that we had done when we looked at the symbols, uh, we saw that we had this 300 in um, the 300 years that uh, Enoch lived after uh, the birth of um, Methuselah. Is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah, so he lives 65 Correct. as Methuselah, and then he lives for 300 more years. And of course, we know he's translated at the end of those 365 years that he lives. And the 365 we would take as a symbol of a year. So we had uh, drawn out on the line. Um, uh, the 65 and the 187, because there's 187 uh, from when Enoch is born, or, or when Enoch has Methuselah to the birth of Lamech, right? And Lamech lives, of course, for 777 years. So we have all these symbols tied together. And then we put those as days within our line. And it came to uh, the 365 days goes from March 2nd, uh, uh, 2019 to March 1st, 2020. So you, we don't know what that particularly means. All that we know is we can take these symbols and we can put them in our line and they tie us together to all these different symbols, the 252, the 187, the 777. So as we continued looking through um, these different symbols, symbols of 300, we could see that there was a parallel in, in how these are applied. That is, in each of these judges where we have a 300, um, it seems to be telling us the same symbol, but in a different context. <clears throat> so where we finished yesterday, we were looking at um, this sphere that weighed 300 shekels, and then we have Abishai, the brother of Joab, who lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them. Um, we also see this same uh, idea of 300 men slain here at one time uh, by Yashobim and Hakamonite, Hakmonite, uh, the chief of the captains. So he lifts up his spear against 300. And then uh, it mentions again Abishai, the brother of Joab. He was chief of the three for lifting up his spear against 300. He slew them. 
and had a name among the three. So that's just basically the same as 2 Samuel 23, 18. Now, when we look at this, uh, um, this symbol of the spear and the 300, what did we say the spear is? Or what did I say it is? Whether other people agree or not. The lines. Yeah, so it's it's the line, and it's a line pointing to something, right? <clears throat> so you know, we can draw a line that's just a line, and it we don't put anything at the beginning or the end. It's just a line. It's just a segment of time. But sometimes I draw lines, and I actually have arrows <clears throat> with those lines, showing that that line is pointing to something else. That's generally why I put the arrow. Right. So if you look at it, it's like a spear or an arrow. They're very similar. Um, <clears throat> so now we have this, this symbol of this spear and the 300, and we have uh, two different instances of 300 that are slain by someone with a spear. So, okay. Yeah, if, yep. if the spear, if the spear is a line, then if if the spear of Ish Benob weighed three hundred shekels of brass in weight, what would that mean? What what symbolism could we apply to that? <coughs> Well, well, we use brass as a symbol of judgment or the removal of God's mercy. Right, but the weight, that's what I'm getting at. Well, we, when we look at weight, we, we have seen that weight is, is referring to um, a measurement uh, that we often associate with time. Right, so... Um, because that's uh, 2 Samuel 21, 16. Let me look this up quick. Okay. <clears throat> so that word that's translated weight um, comes from the word shackle. It's mishackle. So the word shekel, right? So it means, uh, you know, to weigh comes from the idea of suspending or poising, especially in trade. Um, right. I find it interesting in the English translation that the 300 is bookended by two supplied words, one being weighed and the other being shekels. Um, okay. How, how is that interesting? Are they emphasize, you're saying it's an yeah. emphasis upon this word weight and shekel? <clears throat> Same. No, it's, I'm saying the emphasis is on, the emphasis on, is on the 300. Okay. Because if if these are supplied if these are supplied words, then in the English, this would have translated as the weight of whose spear, 300 of brass in weight. Yeah, or it was 300 of brass in weight? You'd have to still put something to make it grammatical right but it calls out the 300 and makes it very it, it draws your eye to that very directly okay yeah and then um, of course weight um, and it says uh, here in ish binab which was of the sons of the giant the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, which is kind of redundant. Very. Yeah. 
So even just that that idea there, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Um, yeah, so this, uh, I'm just looking at the Hebrew construction of the sentence. Yeah, it's just how they do it in Hebrew. <clears throat> yeah, so it's just the way the Hebrew is constructed. That's just how they would normally say it. Okay. Um, So we can see the significance then of this symbol of 300 connected with a message that relates to time, that relates to laying things on a line at least, but a line that's pointing to something. Right, so we don't just have a measuring line here from here to there, we actually have a line that points to something. Now, um, oh, that was the other point. So this is a, um, there appears to be a contradiction, you know, that you always see apparent contradictions when this is compared with the same scripture in um, Chronicles. And so when you have this, Chronicles and you have in Samuel, it mentions uh, here. So it's 2 Samuel 38, 8, I believe, or 23, 8, pardon me. So in 2 Samuel 23, 8, it says, these be the names of the mighty men of whom David had, the Tachmanite, instead of Hach, Hachmanite, that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, that says the same was Adino the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Right? So there's this, these two lists of the mighty men of David, and there seems to be these discrepancies which different people um, uh, try to explain. And um, if you look at the, the translators, they talk about this here. They say, well, they even give us some years for this. Um, uh, the years AM, the years BC. And um, it says the Tachmanite or Jehosha Basabet, the Tachmanite, head of the three. They give us these comparisons in First Chronicles um, 11, 11 to 12, First Chronicles 27, 2 where he's mentioned, and over the first course of the first month was Yashubim, the son of Jabiel, in his course were 20 and 4,000. So he has this uh, uh, course. And Jonathan's David uncle was a counselor of wise men, a scribe, Jehiel, the son of Hakmani, was the king's sons. So it's, they say, it is highly probable that in this version, instead of Yashav Bashavet Yachamoni, we should read Yeshavam ben Hachamoni, Yashabin the son of Hachamoni, and instead of Hu Adino Hatzniel Hu Arir et Chanathio, he lifted up his spear, which are the readings in the parable place in Chronicles, where it is also 300 instead of 800. So they make this note that there's this person where it says 300 and 800. Now we know that there isn't mistakes in the word of God, um, or at least things that appear to be mistakes are purposeful. So why would we look at this 300 and this 800? I know it's, it's kind of going off the track a little bit. But why do we have this 300 and 800? 
What would that mean? Why is it one place 300, one place 800 symbolically? Any thoughts? Does 800 mean anything? Symbolically or literally? Well, symbolically or literally, I mean, 800 literally is just 800. I'm not sure. <clears throat> well, we connect eight, it. We've only... Go okay. ahead, Stephen. So we can add it to be in resurrect. Okay. Right. So so the number eight becomes number six. Eight. Now, when when I think about this, I think about um, um, in uh, November, late late October, early November of 2018. So when we first get the July 18 uh, date, the first thing that Jeff does is he begins presenting what he had meant to present at the camp meeting um, in late October. And that was his studies on the number eight. And um, so when we had July 18th and we saw the 252 days, um, from November 9th to July 18, uh, Jeff had then uh, divided that in half. Uh, I think it's March 14th that's the center of that, uh, 2020. And um, so he took these 126 days. And then he, um, he divided them as eight and eight. So he took that story from Second Chronicles chapter 29, uh, dealing with the cleansing of the temple. So, so we have this number eight attached. So I know we're studying Gideon and we're studying the 300. But if we're going to take these symbols, this symbol of the number eight is, I think, one of the things that has been the most neglected in our understanding. So we know it's the number of the resurrection. What else does it represent? Infinity. Okay, well, infinity, but I'm thinking just more directly when we think about the resurrection of Christ. What day is he resurrected? The first day which is the eighth day which is the eighth day yes okay right so and that's why it's a symbol of the resurrection one of the things it's also on the eighth day is when your a child is circumcised there's other symbols that would attach it to the resurrection but if we're going to take this 300 and we're going to just take this kind of obscure apparent contradiction of scriptures um, and we're going to apply it. Um, we can also see that there is a, a controversy regarding the number eight in the sense that the eighth day is considered, uh, the, the first day of the week is considered Sunday. So is this the number eight also a symbol of the controversy between the Sabbath and Sunday? Interesting point. Okay. So, so one thing we have here is we have a typical Sunday law. 
and we have this 800 and this 300. So that's just a suggestion. Uh, I haven't studied deeply into trying to compare all of these. I know that there's a discrepancy between these two accounts, the one in, in Chronicles and First Chronicles and the one in Second Samuel. Um, one is uh, the section from First Chronicles actually has like 21 words missing um, that just aren't there. They're just cut out. So somehow in, uh, in the preservation of the book of Chronicles, um, it missed out on these, uh, these verses. So I'm not sure particularly why that happened, but it did. And uh, I'm trying to find the list here. Um, so this is about, this is a comment on 1 Chronicles 11.11. 11. Um, and this is, Adam Clark puts this together. And so he compares this and he says, um, there's actually 34 Hebrew words that have been lost out of this part of the passage in, in Chronicles, which are happily preserved in Samuel. Um, and, and he can show how these warriors are divided and the construction of it. So he can clearly show exactly which words uh, are left out because you can just see uh, uh, together. It says they gather them together to battle. That's in verse nine. And then what's left out is, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines unto his hand until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto his sword. The Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herite, and the Philistines were gathered together in the troop, where was a piece of ground of lentils. And so it's just, it goes up to the word troop. So all that section from troop all the way to um, where they started, where they had the word battle, all that's just cut out. So pretty much they're the same account otherwise. Um, now, so, so we have in, in First Chronicles this, this piece missing. And this is in uh, really what's missing in Chronicles is after verse 11. So it, you know, verse 12 up to verse 13, and then halfway through verse 13, it's it just cuts out these 34 Hebrew words. So what would that mean? What does that symbolize? I mean, here we're, we're looking at a, you know, some missing words from, from scripture dealing with this, this whole issue of these mighty men. So, I mean, this is going a little bit off the path of where we were. But how would we take this symbolically? Is, I mean, is this, does God preserve his word? Does he allow these things to happen for a reason? Yes. Okay. So we don't just take these things as random events that, you know, are mistakes or whatever. We, we look at God's word that, that these types of things that occur are purposeful. A, an example of this, where we're looking in uh, Second Kings and comparing it with a passage in in uh, Jeremiah dealing with uh, Jehoiachin when he's released from prison by um, evil Merodach. And there's some differences there. Otherwise they're quoting word for word, but those differences are significant. Uh, one is it says he's released on the 25th day of the 12th month. And the other one I think says the 27th day of the 12th month. So, you know, it, it looks like a contradiction. But actually, when you look at the verse itself, you start to see that they're actually talking about two different events, his actual uh, release from prison physically. And when he's um, uh, sort of the more ceremonial aspect of him being released from prison. And, and of course, there we have a symbol, the 25th day of the 12th month, which symbolizes December 25th. So, so we have these symbols 
that are there. Um, in something that appears to be a contradiction. And, and that draws our attention to it, is the one thing. So where we have this section cut out, 34 Hebrew words, uh, what would that mean then as a symbol? Well, 34, if the digits are added together, gives us seven. Yep. And we also have an expression that occurs often in Hebrew, um, in, in Proverbs, you know, three times, yea, four, or three things, yea, four. Um, but also we have the third angel's message and the fourth angel's message. Correct? Right. Okay, so it being left out, these 34 Hebrew words being left out, what would that symbolize then? So we have these symbols in, in the words themselves, but the fact that they're left out, but found somewhere else. And the thing that leads us to this is First Chronicles 11.11. 11. Right. <clears throat> is it telling us there's <clears throat> something hidden that we need to, to see? And that if we search for it... I think that's possible. And if we search for it, we can find it. Yeah. So, so even these little types of things that you know people just dismiss, I think are are uh, significant. Now, uh, the next one's First Kings ten seventeen, and he made three hundred shields of beaten gold. Uh, three pound of gold went in, went to one shield and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. So this is a Solomon with uh, the temple. Um, so there's 300 shields of beaten gold, uh, three pounds each. So what symbols do we have here with the 300? What, what, what's... So you're dealing with First Kings ten seventeen. Yeah. <clears throat> he made the three hundred shields of beaten gold, but here instead of shekels, it's giving reference to three pound of gold, not pounds, but pound singular. Yeah. Went to one went into one shield. Yeah. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. So what's the, the house of the forest of Lebanon? I don't know. The, we, we, have, we have a couple of things that are, are strange with this verse. Because now we're dealing with pound <coughs> versus shekel, right? Yeah, in, in English. So the translators just use the word pound here. This is actually a manna. Okay. So a manna is either 50 shekels or 60 shekels. All right. 
So that's different from the word that we we saw used in Second Samuel twenty one sixteen that talks of a spear weighing three hundred shekels of brass, right? Yeah, that, yeah, those are three hundred shekels. Here we have, if we're going to put this as shekels, this either be a hundred and fifty shekels or hundred and eighty shekels of gold per uh, shield. So when we compare this in First Kings eleven three with Second Chronicles nine sixteen. We're being told that at that time, that 300 shields made he of beaten gold, 300 shekels of gold went into one shield. Okay, where's this? Second Chronicles 9.16. Yeah, so 300 shields he made he of beaten gold, 300 shekels of gold went into one shield. Um, so, so here, yeah, shekels is a supplied word. Right. So, How does it read in the Hebrew? Um, it just says 300 of gold went into one shield. So it doesn't, uh, provide a word, uh, to describe this. Um, but we have the same placement for the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Yeah. And Shalosh, so. Um, yeah, so 300 just says 300 uh, of gold. went into each shield, uh, shield one, shield each, and Nathan given to the king, the house of Lebanon. Given by the king. So it's given by the king to the house of the forest of Lebanon. Um, so here we could argue, and, and I've seen this argument based on this before, is that there's a hundred shekels per mana uh, at this time when it comes to gold. So, because uh, when I was doing research on the mana and the shekels, they use this verse as an example that there's a hundred shekels per mana. So in this case, we would have to, when we look at... Uh, First Kings 10, verse 17, three mana of gold, each of those mana would then have 100 shekels to it. Okay, now, if we look back at this, I mean, the, the stories in this are identical because we're both dealing with the wealth of Solomon, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but in 1 Kings 10, 17, where it says the 4, 4, Hebrew 4, 4, 8, 8, or mana, yeah. is, used, is used five times in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's used in 1 Kings 10, 17, Ezra 2, 69. Nehemiah 7, 71 and 72, and then Ezekiel 45, 12. Yep. Um, now, in Brown Drivers Briggs, when you look up this word mana, it says mana or mina pound. Those are the ways it's translated. 60 shekels and 1 50th of a talent of silver um and 160th of a talent in early babylonian standard and it says 100 shekels or, and one one hundredth of a talent of gold so there are different ways um when they measure gold and silver on how they divide uh, the manna now if it was 
you know, when we go to uh, uh, Daniel uh, chapter four or it's chapter five, when we have the meeny, meeny, tekel, you farson. So we normally go, um, it's, we're going to have meeny, meeny, tekel, and then you farson is a half of a meeny. So we add that up as uh, 25, 20. Well, well, the first thing is we get it into 126, right? Right. So that as we have a meanie is 50, so we go 50 uh, times 50, and, and so we end up with this um, 100 and then a half, of, which is a eupharsin, uh, that's half a mana, so that's going to be the 25, and then we have the shekel at the end. Now, if we did it as 100, it wouldn't just be 252. It would end up being 251, correct? Because we still have the okay. one. Okay. Now, 251 uh, is a symbol that I keep running into as well. I'm not going to go to it in detail. But, but it's short of the 252 symbol. Now, of course, we normally take the 126 and multiply it by the gira. And so 20 gira to a shekel, and we get the 2520. Um, but when we do the 251 times the gira, we get 5020, 5020. And, and what is that a symbol of? Anybody know the 251? Maybe it's too obscure. Maybe I'll do a study on that another time. Okay. I I mean I'm sitting here looking at the 251 as being the 21st or the 25th day of the first month. Yeah. And asking well, if if that's a symbol that we would well, apply. We don't have the 25th day of the first month as any anything significant. Okay. But but anyway, so so we're just looking at these measurements and we can see that um, that these are consistent. The 300 shields of beaten gold being three pounds or three mana is the same as saying they're 300 shekels of gold. But he puts him in the house of the forest of Lebanon. And, and I'm not sure what, where that place is, what it's referring to. Is it placing it in a cedar house? <sighs> Yeah, well, that's what it seems would seem to me. A house made out of cedar. Th that's possible. Well, it says here, though, in 1 Kings 7, 2, he built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof was 100 cubits, the breadth thereof 50 cubits, and the height thereof 30 cubits. So this seems to be part of the temple um, buildings. Right. So it's all made out of cedar, right? It talks about the cedar pillars and the cedar beams upon the pillars. Okay, so if we've got 100 cubits, 50 cubits, 30 cubits. And we took that as being a cubit of 18 inches. Then we would be 1800 by 900. 
by 540. Okay. Now, if we took that into feet, we're at 150 by 75 by 45. Okay. <coughs> I'm just looking at the at you know what we what we look at as far as overall volume with something like this. The volume would be five hundred and six thousand two hundred and fifty uh, cubic feet. Okay. Kind of sizable, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so so here we have this 300. It's connected with these shields. Now these shields are going to be uh, um, pillaged. Uh, this is going to be in First Kings 1626, dealing with what happens uh, with uh, Rabshaki or What's it not the guy? Um, I think it's Rapshek. Anyway, this is going to be when Rehoboam is king. No, I'm now this is this is way earlier. Um, yeah, so this is in time of Rehoboam. The Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and all the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all that he took away, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Rehoboam made bra brazen shields uh, in their place. So this is under Rehoboam that this occurs. <clears throat> so these 300 shields that are gold are, are taken away by the king of Egypt and replaced with 300 shields of brass. Okay. Now, the other thing about the 300 that we had looked at, the 300 charts, now we know there's 300 uh, 1843 charts. There was also 300 1850 charts. Can we make any comparison between these shields and these charts? I don't remember us doing that yesterday, but that'd be a good comparison. Okay. Now, can we say anything about the, the, the spoiling of the gold shields and the replacing them of the brass shields? Is Could this in any way represent uh, the 300 charts of Miller and then the 300 1850 charts? Or is that not a good comparison? Why wouldn't it be a good comparison? Well, if it's a good comparison, what, what what comparison are we making? What are we trying to say about the 1850 chart? And uh, the King of Egypt and Rehoboam, how would that apply? Well, if the fields of brass are representative of the 1850 chart, then is this a, a symbol of pending judgment? Yeah, because brass representing judge, judgment. Yeah. Right. Now, 
Now, we know, of course, God gave an increase of light. But with the 1850 chart, does it accomplish as much as the 1843 chart accomplished? No, never no. did. No. And now, now the, they had 300 preachers with the 300 Millerite charts. Uh, that's not really what happened with the 1850 chart. Now, the 1850 chart, uh, because I studied the history of the chart, so they had 300 charts, but there wasn't a lot of Adventists in 1850. Um, it took about uh, from 1850 to 1863, which is why they made the 1863 chart, is they ran out of the 1850 charts. That is, it took them a while to run out of them. And a lot of them just ended up on the walls of Adventist homes. So, I mean, partly would be for uh, doing a presentation if you're doing a Bible study at your house. Um, so they need, that's one of the reasons they needed a new chart in 1863, is they just had run out of charts. But they had printed 300 of them. Now, with the 1863 chart, uh, they actually do a number of printings. The, so the 1863 chart is reprinted, but it's not as good quality as the 1850 and the 1843 charts. So the 1863 chart is a paper chart um, that then is uh, glued onto cloth. Uh, where the the 1843 uh, chart and the 1850 chart are not paper charts. Right, they're, they're, they're lithographed onto cloth already. So, so there's some differences. And they make a lot more of the 1863 charts. Now, when we talk about paper, there's different qualities of paper. So this will obviously be fairly high quality paper not something like what we usually think of as paper, but uh, probably a cloth type of paper, high quality paper. But, but there's a difference anyway, between these charts, all these different charts. Um, and anything else we can think about with this, these 300 representing these charts, how would that affect us in our time? Would we have to say that there is some comparison to these different 300s? That even though we have 300 attached to our time, uh, to Gideon's 300, is there a repeat? Wouldn't there have to be? Well, not necessarily. I mean, we, we could look at just the 1843 chart, it's repeated with the 1850 chart. And then, you know, we can look at the parallel between us and Millerite history and just take the 300 as, as one symbol. The question is, can we have a taking away of the 300 and a replacing of it with another 300? Does that symbolize anything that we can see in our movement? Because we're taking the 300 as a warning message, right? And we can see that the charts are warning messages. So if we're going to say that we can make an application, how would we make it? Any thoughts by anyone? I'm considering your question. I just don't have a direct answer. Okay. Well, it's maybe something to think about. 
I mean, we know that Jeff applied the story of Gideon, the 300, to the July 18, 2020 prediction itself. But we, we have to see that this 300 of Gideon um, is a whittle, comes from the result of a whittling away. And that whittling away definitely was not complete in July 18. So, could we say that the, the 300 was taken away in some way and replaced as a message? Because we're taking the 300 as a message. Not necessarily replaced in the sense of, you know, the first message is wrong, but just a further understanding of it, but also a diminishing of it. In, in certain aspects and what it accomplishes. It's a thought. I don't know if it's, if we could really apply it or not. Well, let, let's move on to more of these 300s. So um, first King, Kings 11.3, he had 700 wives, princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. So this would be referring to Solomon, I believe, correct? It has to be referring to Solomon. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Solomon. What what other what other king in Bible history? I can't think such an attitude. <laughs> no one except Solomon. So I'm I'm just making sure. Right. I'm just um <clears throat> Now, of course, we know seven is a number of completion, as is the number three, right? Okay. Uh, do we ever see this seven and three anywhere else? Because I think this is a different symbol. I, don't, I wouldn't really apply this to the 300, um, but seven and three is another symbol. And that's, that's the purpose behind this study because <laughs> what we're looking at is bringing all the verses together to see if this supports the premise. And it may support more than one premise. Yeah. So the where the place that I commonly think of the seven and three is Job. He had seven sons and three daughters. And and that's showing this uh, completion. So when I see seven and three together, whether it's seven hundred and three hundred or seven and three, uh, that in itself is a symbol. So I wouldn't take the three hundred here and try to make an application of it to the 300 of Gideon. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why, why I'm saying that? So just because we see 300 mentioned, we have to also consider the context of that 300 and that it's in the context of 700 and 300 or seven and three. So that's that's why I wouldn't just I would just wouldn't take this symbol here and try to apply it because it's a different context and it's actually a different symbol, even though it looks the same on the surface. <coughs> Now, uh, the next one, 2 Kings 18, 14, Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent unto the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended, return from me, that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So this is going to be the tribute, the annual tribute. I, I would believe it would be annual, but I'm not certain um, whether it's just a one-time tribute. But this is, of course, that Assyrian protection racket. The Babylonians did the same thing. 
So the king of Judah is asking the king of Assyria to be his protector and wants to do whatever tribute you want me to pay, I'll pay it. So that's the tribute. Now, again, we have 300 and we have 300 in connection with 30 talents of gold and 300 talents of silver. So a talent is depending on different systems of measure. Uh, it's sometimes 60 uh, mana, sometimes it's 50, sometimes it's 100. So this is a lot of gold and silver uh, that the king of Judah is going to be paying to the king of Assyria. But again, would we take the 300 here and make an application to the 300 of Gideon? Or is this some other symbol? Because we have 300 talents and 30 talents, one of silver, one of gold. But this is a different context and a different symbol. Or is it the same symbol? Any thoughts? How we could, we could show that? Well... If it's, if it's the same symbol, is it another type of a doubling? Where you have one at one level and the other at one tenth of that level or a fractal, fraction of that amount. Well, see here in the case of Hezekiah, um, being having to pay to the king of Assyria. I mean, this three is now more in the symbol of a completion, right? Of course, 330. Um, I don't know if I would do that with this one. I would say it's a different symbol, even though it looks the same on the surface. And there are some similarities because even the fact that it's Gideon's 300 is a symbol of completion. That is, that number is complete. The ones who are to give, uh, you know, the trumpet warning and, and break the pitchers and let their torches shine and that are going to conquer uh, the Midianites. But I don't know if we could just take, because it says 300 talents of silver, we can now try to take this story and apply it to our line. The 300 is, is serving a different purpose here than in the story of Gideon. So in the other ones, we can, we can see the connections. We can see the symbolic connections in the story. And maybe there's something here that I'm missing, but I don't see the connection. So <clears throat> the way that this verse reads <clears throat> is <clears throat> Hezekiah is saying to the king of Assyria, I have offended. When he says return from me, is that a version of an apology? And he's saying that the burden that you place upon me, I will agree to okay yeah so this expression return from me yeah it's yeah. kind of a weird expression and in, in hebrew has this strange way of of using this word because uh, that's just the word shuv um so it can mean return it can mean turn right and so we don't think of the word as return and turn as the same because of how we we think of the word return right but but the word return actually means turn turn again well 
Not necessarily. <laughs> okay. Right. I, I, that's what I'm tr trying to say is that here they use in English, they use the word return, but it can just mean turn. Even the word return can just mean turn. Now we can say it means turn again, right? Which literally is what it means. But he can just be saying turn from me. That is, I want you to return away from me. I don't want you to be, um, you know, m coming against me, right? So it, it just it's just kind of a weird expression. Um, you know, some translations use the word withdraw, right? Um, leave me alone, right? That's a more, you know, paraphrase uh, type of thing. Right, so you, you can see that um, You can see the point then that I'm getting. Yep. Okay. Hezekiah is saying to the king of Assyria, to Assyria I have offended. Stop pressing me. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, turn from me. That which you have placed upon me or puttest on me, I will bear. Yep. Now, then the next portion, and the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 <laughs> talents of gold. So Hezekiah is being required to pay this as a tribute, right? Yes. Yeah, this is the protection money that he has to pay, right? And he's going to even cut off the gold from the doors of the temple and from the pillars, which Hezekiah, the Judah, had overlaid, and he gave to the king of Assyria. So all I'm saying here is that the 300, we have, we have a story here that's interesting, but there's nothing here that I see would tie us to the 300 of Gideon as a symbol. All right. Just because it says 300 talents and we see the word 300 doesn't mean we can just take a verse and say, this is the story of Gideon, right? This is illustrating the same story because this doesn't appear to be in the same context. And the symbol doesn't appear to be the same because it's attached to the 30 talents of gold as well. So somebody can say that's a no, 10. But right? The only thing that's here that would tie us back to this with Gideon and that would tie us back to Enoch and Joseph and all the rest is that those 300 talents of silver are being applied as a type of a judgment. Yeah, but this is a different different type of judgment, and this isn't really a message. Right? I, I'm not disagreeing with that yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, all we can say is that 300 can be used as a judgment, a symbol of judgment. That's what you're saying. Okay. So we, That's correct. But we can't take this story and try to line it up because we have with the other stories. We've take we've seen more symbols involved. Now, the only thing you could say here, because he's going to take the door uh, the gold from off the doors of the temple, and and also from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid. So there are some pillars that are going to have uh, gold removed from them. There's doors that are going to have gold removed from them. Um, and they're going to go under go under siege. I mean, you might say um, in getting the protection of Assyria, there's these are people who are rejecting the message of Gideon and 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 seeking protection from the world, right? If we're going to apply it in any way, right? Well, I mean, the the situation as you just presented it there. This is not relying on God's wisdom or God's protection. It's relying upon man's. Right. So, I mean, it's sort of the opposite of what Gideon is doing. 
So it could symbolize a rejection of that message. So it's the antithesis. So yes, rejection of the message that we saw in this with Enoch, with Gideon, with Joseph, and all the others. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to have the 300 shields of gold mentioned again, which we already looked at. Right. Um, now here, this one, 1,300 chariots, or 1,000,000 ,000 and 300 chariots. So he comes out, um, and second Chron comes out against them, Zira, Zira the Ethiopia. Now, this story is, um, I didn't look this one up. So this is in the reign of As Asa. I would believe that to be correct. I mean, so here we have 300 chariots. Again, we have the number 300. Um, I haven't looked at this story, so I can't tell you much about it. Um, so Ace is going to do some work of reform. He's going to take away the altars, the high places, break down the images, cut down the groves. Um, he's going to build some fenced cities in Judah. The land had rest and he had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. Um, so it's going to go through this and then the Ethiopians are going to come against him um, with a host of a thousand thousand and 300 chariots and came unto Marisha. And then Asa went out against him and they said in battle array in the valley of Zephatha at Marisha. Um, so here again, this is a, a, a number 300, 300 chariots, but it's associated with a group of other numbers, a thousand thousand. And can we take anything from this story just because it has 300 in it? Well, there is a large force coming against a king that is attempting some reforms, but not all the reforms. Um, Does this, go ahead. Um, Um, do you see where he doesn't do all the reforms? I don't see any negative thing regarding As Asa. Okay. Doesn't seem to be a reason that a judgment is coming upon him. Okay. But in in Second Chronicles 14.6, it says that he built fence cities in Judah for the land had rest and he had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. Yeah, so the Lord gives him rest for 10 years, um, which we see earlier. It's 10 years. Um, but yeah, it doesn't say anything negative about him. Okay. Right. So, so this these Ethiopians coming against him. Asa cries unto God, and uh, he delivers them.
So they're, they're completely Victorian, okay. no negative aspect. So this doesn't appear to be a judgment from God for anything. We also have 300 here in the sense 300,000 that bear targets and spears that Asa had. Yeah, but that's 300,000. Yeah, I know. I'm saying you still have the number 300 in, in that sense as a symbol. But all I'm saying is that here, I wouldn't apply these to, at least I wouldn't. I don't see enough here to say these are symbols about this movement presently. I mean, obviously, there's always parallels in scripture. but I don't see any particular point here that we can use. Okay. But that's just me, you well, know, I <laughs> understand, <clears throat> but we've got, <clears throat> we have to be able to present all of these to be able to consider what fits and what doesn't. Right. But, but the point I'm making, like when we have a bunch of numbers of different things, like on the next one, um, 2 Chronicles 35, 8, and his princes gave willingly unto the people, to the priests and to the Levites, Hilkiah and Zechariah and Jehu Jehiel, rulers of the house of God, gave unto the priests for the Passover offerings, 2,600 small cattle and 300 oxen. So here we have some numbers. And one of these numbers is 300 oxen. And so I don't just say because there's 300 that I immediately have to take this 300 and line it up with the 300 of Gideon. Because there are other things happening here, other numbers of which these are just a part. Something like the 300 shields, um, you know, we can see all these parallels. But here I wouldn't just take the numbering of these, these animals and say we have to fit this with the story of Gideon. You know, and I say that because I see people do that sometimes. They will take something they see, um, one thing, and then they try to force it to fit into something else. But they don't consider all of the symbols involved. And I'm not saying here that there isn't more symbols because I haven't examined it. But I'm just saying, just because it says 300 oxen, you can't just, for that reason, fit it into the story of Gideon. And here you're not going to see something as judgment or a message, a warning of the close of probation or anything like that. Now, uh, the section in 2 Chronicles 35.8 is um, uh, addressing Josiah's uh, Passover, right? Right. So, so this just happens to be an association with that. Now, we could argue Josiah's Passover is, has some symbol, and we could try to fit, see where that fits into our movement. I don't know if we've ever tried to do that. But a Passover is a Passover. That is, Passovers can be lined up on top of each other. But there's so many different things happening here in this story, different numbers of different offerings and so forth. Here we just have this 300 oxen. To me, there isn't a reason to take this and try to make much out of that 300 oxen. It, it is a symbol, but it's also part of these other numbers. And, and these and three is a symbol of completion, right? So Josiah gave to the people of the flock, lambs and kids, this is verse seven of Second Chronicles 35, for the Passover offerings, for all that were present, to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bullocks. These were of the king's substance, and the princes gave willingly unto the people, to the priests and to the Levites, 
Hilkiah and Zechariah and Jehiel, rulers of the house of God, gave unto the priests for the Passover offerings 2,600 small cattle and 300 oxen. Um, and then it says, Conaniah also and Shemamiah and Shemaiah and Nethaniel, his brethren, and Hashabiah and Jeiel and Josabad, chief of the Levites, gave unto the Levites for Passover offerings <coughs> 5,000 small cattle and 500 oxen. So, so we could go through these and look at all, all of the symbolic numbers here. And we could then apply them to the story of Josiah's Passover and see the significance of them. But then we would have to take Josiah's Passover and say, does this symbolize what's happening in the movement presently? Maybe it's something in the past in the movement. Maybe it's something in the future. Now, um, okay. we have about 11 minutes here, so I just want to get through this next part. Um, so we're going to have, again, another 300 males that's mentioned in Ezra 8.5. Now, we know, of course, that story from Ezra 7 to 10 applies to uh, uh, this movement, right? We've already established Correct. But, but we can't necessarily just take this 300 and, and do that because this is a whole list of all these different people um, of these, you know, how many sons of different uh, uh, people. You know, you got 200, you got 300, you got 50, you got 70, you got 80, you have uh, 218, um, 28, um, 110, uh, 60, and 70, all listed of these different sons of different people, right? Now, all of these are going to be sig significant symbols in some way. But, you know, it might be them being added together. There might be some mathematical aspect to it. But the fact that there, one of them is 300 it's not a significant symbol in this story that you could take it and make it stand out to take this whole story and say that that 300 represents the 300 of Gideon. Now with the next ones, we can see some things that are, are more, more important. So one of the things about the 300 that we saw in some of the other verses killing 300 people or 300 people uh, defeating an enemy. Those become important symbols of 300. So in Esther 9.15, for the Jews which were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also because they had defended themselves on the 13th day of the month Adar and slew 300 men at Shushan, but on the prey they laid not their hands. So they didn't spoil them. Um, at least that's the way I take that. So we have 300 men at Shushan being killed on the 14th day of the 12th month. We can take this as consistent with the 300 in the other symbols that are used, correct? I would believe that to be correct. Um, so, because we already know that this is representing the Sunday law and Gideon's representing the Sunday law. So the fact that there's 300 men killed here is significant in tying these stories together. We also have some chronological in information here that we we can tie it to as well. So we know when it occurred. Now, the 300, the one that we haven't really mentioned so much, which is not really a biblical 300, but it is the 300, that's the Battle of Thermopylae. Is that prophetically significant? 
300 Spartans. I think it's a symbol that can tie in with a lot of the things that we're dealing with. Okay, right. And, and because we know that also is in the book of Esther, doesn't have it, but we know that the battle in, uh, of Thermopylae is connected with this battle, this war, this conquering plans uh, that Xerxes makes uh, in Esther chapter one. And it's going to be after all of these battles, when he gets back, that he's then going to pick a new wife to replace Vashti. And, you know, so we spend time studying Esther, trying to understand all of the historical events. And which, which was really clear in, in showing who Esther was, um, that she is the wife of... Um, of Xerxes, and that we can we can place her name historically. I can't remember the name, but um, so so we have all of these things that tied us into that history. But we know that the story of Esther is a symbol of the Sunday Law, as is the story of Gideon. They're already the same story. So the killing of the three hundred here and the three hundred Spartans as well gives us a symbol that attaches us to the Sunday Law to this period of judgment. Now, uh, the last one, uh, John 12, verse five. Why, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, if we're gonna take what we've been doing, could we take this as 300 pence as a symbol that would tie us to to the 300 of Gideon, or is it some other symbol? Now, this is Judas. Well, we know who's... <clears throat> yeah, this is, this is Judas speaking <clears throat> before all the other disciples and criticizing Mary. Right. Yeah. So this goes right back to where we've been studying about being critical of others. Yeah. So it's, it's a way, I mean, what Judas is saying is why honor God when you, when this offering <clears throat> could have been turned into money, which of course he's just going to steal. Correct. So this would be sort of the message that, that is existing now in the movement is this message of jealousy, of selfishness, all in a pretense of honoring God. Right. Right. And so they give lip service to the 300, but it's all just a pretense. They give lip service right. to the message, but they're really, their heart's not in the message at all. So that's a pretty harsh thing to say about other people. I mean, we but don't it's know. it's a realistic observation. Yeah, so we know it occurs in the movement because it, it's been shown to us symbolically that it occurs. And so this 300 here would be significant in that context. We also have right. uh, that this is uh, six days before the Passover. Jesus came to Bethany, right? So we know this is tied to the week of Christ study. Correct? Right. Okay. So, so we have all of these, these uh, elements that we can take, and even uh, she takes a pound of ointment of spikenard, right? Anointed, anoints Christ's feet and wipes his feet with her hair, right? So this is about a message, right? The house is filled with the odor of the ointment, but we have Judas, who symbolically in this message has, has, is representing those that reject the message giving this lip service to these to the 300 to the message itself 
but it's self-serving. Okay, um, so eighth day of the first month. So this is going to be uh, Saturday night. So technically this is on the ninth day of the first month. But Jesus is gonna come on the eighth day of the first month. Um, so he's actually gonna come Friday night. So, which is going to be Saturday. That's the eighth day of the first month. The ninth day of the first month is going to be the Sunday, starting, of course, sunset Saturday. And we know the 10th day of the first month is going to begin um, after the um, all of the hosannas, what's that called again, the triumphal entry, right? And, and Christ then, after sunset, he's going to enter into the temple. He becomes that lamb that's set aside on the 10th day of the first month for offering in his father's house because he's that's where you're supposed to bring it into your home. And, of course, his home is his father's house, the temple. So, so anyway, that's just, Angela, putting that comment about the eighth day of the first month. So it is it symbolizes the priests. 81. So we have all these symbols. We can see that the 300 here is, um, throughout scripture, is a consistent message that adds to our understanding of the story of Gideon and helps place that story in the present context. Right. So any, any final thoughts on this 300? I mean, we can come back to it again on Sunday if there's thoughts that people have. Okay. But yeah, it's definitely productive to go through those verses. <clears throat> okay, so we can now close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the light that continues to shine upon our path. And we ask, Lord, for your strength, for your peace, for your presence, uh, that we can walk with confidence as we uh, go through these events prophetically that are before us. We know, Lord, that there are... Um, predictions being made about the coming election and what's going to happen. And we know, Lord, that you have seen all things. And um, we also have a date, November 24th, the Thanksgiving, whatever that means symbolically. We just ask, Lord, that you can help us to trust in you. Uh, we pray for those whose hearts are set on the wrong thing that are unwilling to see their sins, and that would include all of us, Lord. Uh, we ask that you can show us our need of you and that we can cling close to you, cling to you as we um, go through the various trials that you have given to us. Help us, Lord, to understand the true message that can undo all of Satan's wiles. Be with us now throughout this day, or may your angels watch over us and bring us again tomorrow evening to study your word. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.